possible. With us today is Garrett Everidge, Managing Director of the Alaska Ocean Cluster. With us today is Garrett Everidge, Managing Director of the Alaska Ocean Cluster. Garrett, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. 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 Thank you for having me.
On the commodity side, though, as we compete with other protein sources, other sources of seafood, um, my perception is that competition will continue to be strong and, and could slow any type of price appreciation. As we look forward, um, my instinct around what our successful companies and what wealth creation in our communities looks like, it's going to look different than it looked in the past, right? If, if, if you started Trident today or an equivalent, it's probably going to look different. Same thing with wealth creation. You know, there's a bunch, we're going to talk about venture capital. Venture capital startups are kind of a, a newer source of wealth creation, um, something that wasn't really at play 30 years ago. I, I worry about small boat fleets, um, their ability to remain you know, financially viable, um, their, their place in the market, um, the, the inability to um, be more in control over their entire supply chain. Like they're not vertically integrated. That's where I think catcher processors are kind of in a favorable position. Next slide. So I'm an economist, right? Um, I look through the world from kind of an economist lens with the, the positives and the negatives that that, that bring with it. Uh, my instinct is that over time, um, our profitability um, to the present has declined. Now, we don't have good data on this, um, but if you just look at the past 30 years, um, looking at, next slide, looking at kind of our expenses, our operating expenses, looking at our revenue, um, the gap between the two is troublesome. Next slide. So if you want some actual official data, um, instead of just Garrett's citation, you can kind of look at where we've been over the last several, you know, since 1960s. Um, and this to me, uh, as somebody that kind of places a lot of emphasis on the need to have profitability in a system to be able to modernize, incorporate new ways of doing things, to be resilient against things like climate change, this is worrying to me. Um, you know, one thing about this is that in the early 90s, we saw a flood of ground fish. In just a few years, we saw something like 3 billion pounds of ground fish added here. That, of course, depressed kind of that average price as we move from more of like a salmon or crab um, type trajectory um, into a higher volume, lower value commodity fishery. But so this, this is X vessel um, value. If you do the same thing with first wholesale, you kind of see the same thing. It, it doesn't look great. If you look at individual species like salmon, you kind of see a similar thing. Um, there are some nuances, of course, crab, like king crab looks great. We don't have any king crab right now. Um, halibut looks pretty good. Uh, once again, we don't have much halibut. Um, so there are, there are nuances in this data. Um, but the overall trend uh, is, is challenging. Next slide. You know, similarly, this is, these are data on operating cost, right? The top one is just our energy prices. You know, I don't need to tell you that everything has increased. Um, this is marine transportation, like vital for our, for our state as, as we're moving fish into the market. Next slide. Um, labor, labor cost up, steel up. Like, I don't need to tell you that all of our costs are rising. And, and it's concerning to me because our the what we're pulling out of the ocean is not rising um, to match this increase. When we think about labor costs, this is a tough one because we all want wages to rise, right? Um, but if our companies are paying a wage rate that challenges their viability, uh, there's there's tension here in in that that balance. Next one. So. What I've painted a picture is kind of an industry that is struggling with profitability. We're entering a, a period of change. Um, I could just sit down, but that's not very satisfying, right? Like, so let's let's say I'm right. What should our response be? Next slide. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about kind of three ways we can respond to it, categorized into three buckets of, of types of innovation. The first is technology. Um, I'm, I mentioned venture capital, and and right now. Um, outside of the state and to some degree within the state on a, on a very small way. We're, we're seeing billions of dollars flow into just the ocean tech space. So ocean tech can be anything from, you know, an, an unmanned 
drone, like sail drone that can survey fish stocks or do coastal mapping. Um, it can include things like advanced um, ocean data. Um, it can include things like different ways to freeze or keep fish cool. Um, next slide. You can kind of look across this um, and just see some of the specific firms. What, there, there's, there's kind of two elements here. Um, the first is that you know, I want a Kodiak kid to be involved with, with one of these startups. And, and there's no reason why we couldn't have a high school or a college kid that fished in the summer, went to school for engineering or computer science, participate here. Um, in fact, you could argue that some of our kids who fish in the summer have a knowledge about the industry, know our challenge. They're actually optimally situated to kind of be a vector for that type of innovation. Um, startups are risky. Most of them fail. Um, but one of the key challenges here with having a Kodiak kid be involved is that we just don't really have an ecosystem. We, we don't have a culture of this type of um, investing and value creation and technology, as opposed to someplace like, I mean, Seattle, Boston, Singapore, right? We're just, we're not there yet. Um, I mean, this is a problem for the entire state. Um, we don't necessarily, we, we, we hardly see any venture backed companies come out of Alaska, to my knowledge, maybe two in the last few years. But if, if we go back to my point about how wealth creation and value creation is going to look different, this is one of the key areas that that we are now as a society generating wealth. Um, the other element, uh, you can go to the next slide, about startups. This is where the Alaska Ocean Cluster comes in. Um, we are working with 11 companies right now um, to basically um, look for areas where these startups, these startups that I mentioned can help the Alaska seafood industry, the Alaska ocean industry. So the way this works, um, myself, uh, my colleague Taylor Holzhauser, we are funded by a federal grant. Um, and we basically look, we have one foot in the tech world and the startup world, one foot in the Alaska ocean sector. And we try to see, hey, where, where can sail drone help out? Where can pull Arctic help out? Um, several of these are Alaska companies. Most are not Alaska companies. Um, some of the, the, the way we try to approach this work to be a bit more specific is we try to have a project with every company. We, tr we try to start the engagement with a project. So with, I'll just mention a few. With Pole Arctic, this is a company um, that has expertise around sea ice forecasting. Um, we have helped them get a project going with the snow crab fishermen. Sadly, uh, not much of that is going on right now in the Bering Sea, but they are offering better information to snow crab fishermen in the Bering Sea for where exactly that ice edge will be. Um, they are able to, um, the pilot project right now is we're trying to beat the ice desk, beat the existing data that's out there to allow them to have better confidence on their ability to fish closer to the ice edge and avoid losing pots. Last season, um, the ice came down and 300 pots were lost. So we're, we're talking about some pretty significant costs here. Um, Blue Ocean Gear, another one. Uh, this is a company out of California that makes a, a device, a seven inch buoy that connects onto fixed gear. It transmits location, temperature. Uh, it has an accelerometer. It's being used right now in the golden crab fishery. Um, that's a good fit for that. Um, the fishing in that fishery, um, they encounter, uh, they, they fish strings of pots. Um, they, they fish in significant depths and um, it's a good match to be able to leave Dutch right in time that when you hit your ebb tide, ebb, ebb tide your buoy pops up. Um, so they're able to reduce fuel consumption, kind of optimize some of their, their operating. Um, sail drone is another one. Like we, we've been trying to get sail drone. Um, uh, they've done work in the past here. Uh, we would love the idea of, you know, Pollock B season, for example, um, when the Paul herd is, are dispersed and kind of difficult to find, uh, you know, scout the Pollock biomass with a sail drone as opposed to a 350 foot catcher processor. Um, you know, so our, our, our process is, uh, is kind of messy. Um, we're not claiming that everything is going to work, but we, you know, where there's opportunity, we, we want to try it. Next one. Um, business model innovation. 
So this is another one as we think just about these, like how, how we engage with the future. You can kind of go through the list and think about just the different business models for these companies. Um, and there, there's something about businesses kind of coming out of the time period in which they were founded. Like if you think about Trident, the incredible amount of business innovation, uh, business model innovation that they've pushed. You know, think about the Bountiful, right? A, a crabber that's harvesting crab, processing it on board. Like that's a business model innovation. You can go through these, Alaska Leader, right? Fully integrated, starting from pulling a codfish out of the water to having ready to meet, ready to eat meals. Silver Bay, obviously an innovation that came out of the weak salmon prices. They pioneered kind of the high volume H and G salmon um, approach. Uh, Sick of Salmon Shares, you know, a newer company that's that's adopting a different business model, uh, trying to trying to deliver fish uh, right to your doorstep. Um, this other one, uh, Arctic Seafood Ventures. You could go to the next slide. The, this is this company doesn't exist. Okay, I made this logo this morning, but you can read this story about how it could exist. Um, and this is what I'm trying to get at with with business innovation, where where I where a group of people are coming together, taking elements of different approaches and kind of um, matching their business approach with what is available at the time. So this is, this is uh, an, an illustration of, of what we could do in Kodiak. I mean, the, the most challenging thing in my mind is getting those seven fishermen to come together and agree. It's not, it's, I mean, I think that's it. It's, it's the agreement part. Um, maybe the numbers are a little bit, uh, a little bit off, but by my back of the envelope calculations, this is all feasible. Uh, next slide. And then this is the slide that I get in trouble with. So um, if, if we're entering a, a period of, of change led by climate change, but also kind of buttressed by global competition. You know, my, my instinct is that our regulatory process needs to also change. But since statehood, we've, we've gone through this process of kind of trying to stabilize fisheries, right, through limited entry permits, allocations. We've, we've in some ways pulled the dynamism out of our fisheries, the ability to change. Um, but it's my sense that we're going to need to change um, as our environment changes, as our economics change. Um, so the slinky pots are, are a great example of this, of like uh, a technological innovation that, that was able to meet the needs of fishermen trying to avoid uh, whale incidents. Um, so we, we saw this, this ability for longliners to use slinky pots. Um, the Chignik Cooperative, Right. This is uh, this is an interesting scenario that came together um, due to low salmon prices. Um, uh, fish traps. Right. There's um, there's some interesting developments in Washington and Oregon where there's considerations of using salmon fish traps because you can select for uh, Chinook and you can capture your um, target species while letting the Chinook out. Um, you know, in, in terms of just a, the ability to shift regulations, whether it's a board of fish regulations or at the legislative level, um, you know, my sense is that we just need the ability to, to shift, to, to try new things out. I mean, to let fishermen try different gear types. Um, it's, I, I think my perspective here is that if, if we're entering a period of of change and maybe pronounced change, we we need to include all the tools of our toolbox. Um, we can't just right from the beginning say, you know, this is off limits, that's off limits, that's off limits. Um, next slide. Um, so just in closing, you know, this is this is from from my perspective, this profitability challenge is is kind of the the at the bottom of of all of the turmoil. Um, as we think about allocations and, you know, the opposition to rationalization and um, just all the, the turmoil that, that we're familiar with, um, it's my sense that if, if we're all a bit more profitable, um, the vitriol can decline a bit. Um, so, that, I mean, this is the goal that, that we would 
somehow be engaging on the innovation side um, and try to see that number trend higher. Um, next one. Uh, next one. Okay, so questions. Uh, maybe instead of you asking me questions, I mean, I, I'd love to get your, your feedback. Like, as you think about the future, I mean, what, what are some of the key factors that are in your mind? Um, anyway, with that, I'll take questions, but I'm also curious what, what folks are thinking. I have a question here. Um, you gave the example of the fictional company with the seven fishermen. Sure. Um, why, what aspect of it would make it in, in your, you know, example, difficult for those seven fishermen to come together? Different yeah. visions, they don't have the extra capital, something I'm not sure. thinking of. So I think the primary thing that would prevent the seven fishermen from coming together is that nobody wants to deal with marketing. Nobody wants to um, have to fly down to Seattle and talk to a market, you know, talk to the grocery store that are gonna be distributing their fish. Um, f in my experience, fishermen wanna fish, period. I mean, I had a fisherman tell me that this week and I was telling him something like, why don't you go do this? Like, if you're complaining, start a business and go compete. Um, that's my, that's my sense. Uh, I don't necessarily think the capital is a challenge. You can see just, you know, if everybody can contrib contribute 15, 20 grand, like you can start to develop enough capital to try something out, um, different visions possibly. Right. But I, I think mainly the, the difficulty here is, is kind of that more administrative coordination side that's needed to start a business. And then to just have somebody that is going to be the person taking the call um, when folks are fishing, um, you, you kind of need a non-fishing person to help start a business like that. I thought your comments about the fish traps were pretty shocking, but uh you know, you realize that we became a state because the fish traps, the Absolutely. traps were owned by, uh, all, by everyone in Seattle, all of them were owned by Seattle. And so when we voted on, on fish traps and statehood and the constant convention, something like, I, I don't know my figures, but like 75% voted in favor of uh, getting rid of fish traps, uh, 65 in favor of uh, becoming a state and 55 in favor of the constitution. Uh, so fish traps carried, uh, but you know that was because uh, the traps were owned by Seattle uh, folks and not by Alaskans. So maybe there's an innovative way of, of finding a way for Alaskans to be involved in that, and maybe there'd be more support for it then. Thank you. Yeah, it's yes. I recognize the difficult history here. Um, I shouldn't be talking about it, but it's my sense that we kind of need to look at everything in our toolbox, um, particularly when you have a situation like what's happening on the Yukon River, right, where, um, you know, up until last year, or the prior year, um, you know, their fisheries were closed, because from what I understand, um, because of the incidental catch with Chinook, there were plenty of chums running upstream, but the fisheries were closed because ADF and G didn't want to have the, the Chinook incidentally harvested. So you were, they were placed in this difficult challenge with because their gear wasn't selective enough, they couldn't open up the chum fishery. So that's a case where, well, if we have more selective gear or if we could preserve the, the Chinook to be released, um, at the minimum, we need to have a good answer for why we're not doing this. I mean, besides the constitution. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Well, and, and there's this tension, right? Like on between kind of the equity component of, of when we're engaging with a natural resource, spreading out the, the profits and the activity to the maximum number of people, as opposed to having the one boat that starts every year in you know Southeast and just does everything. Like we're, we're always placing ourselves on that continuum between equity and maybe economic efficiency. Julie. So uh, just to tag on to that, I mean, so we basically um, 
we're not efficient, right? Mm -hmm. So you have all the salmon boats, just for an example, that's, and if you had a fish trap, then how are you gonna, all those jobs are gonna go away and yep. how do you deal with the revenue side? It's a big question. It's a social question versus just straight economics. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we get wrapped up in uh, social justice sometimes versus trying to be economically profitable. I mean, obviously from a processor perspective, probably the biggest thing is labor. And so it, from a mechanization of processing is you know really the future, I think for the processing sector, but then you have all those jobs that disappear. And for a community like Kodiak, where we have a, a disappearing residential workforce, I guess, uh, it, it really, um, so if you just, based your talk on profitability and how you wanna be more economically whole, then we would not care about the number of fishermen and, or the number of jobs in the processing sector. And we would be extremely efficient. We would do fish traps. We would have catch a processors. Yeah. We'd have mechanization, less regulation, and so I just don't know how that we could uh, break down all those barriers to get to your vision for 2050. I mean, is it about the money or is it about the social justice or is it a combination of both? And that's what you fight in the policy arena Absolutely. all the time. You know, I, I, get, I guess the question for me too is like, what, it, assuming, you know, we just kind of let things unravel. Like, what does that look like, right? I mean, we're very hesitant to even talk about the possibility of what consolidation would mean because of the job losses, the challenges for the community. But there's a scenario where that happens anyway, right? And so that's, that's the challenge is like, who's gonna take the political uh, hit to advocate for a more efficient, and profitable industry um, in the face of declining profitability. Well, and that's one of the main debates on rationalization, right? In terms of becomes a lot more economically efficient, you have less bycatch, um, and so and it becomes more profitable, both on the because the quality of the product goes up, so the ex vessel price is better. The vessels spend less money in fuel because they're not you know in such a hurry. You got all the safety, so it's a better economic outcome. But some people argue on a social side that that's not a good outcome. So it's it's very <laughs> difficult. It's it's a really difficult dynamic. But my my sense is that we've kind of, I mean, particularly on the state side, we've if you think about that continuum, we, we've placed ourselves reliably more on the on the equity side, right? I mean, look at look at Bristol Bay, like. It's, it's a great example of that. I mean, things are great right now. Um, but, but then you have the whole question of the quality of the product, the smaller boats, um, you know, uh, so you got a lot of jobs, but in the reality, in terms of the fish you're extracting, you probably get a lot of better fish if it was a lot more efficient. And uh, somebody would shoot me if I said that out loud as a policy shift, but- Yeah, which uh, is why like, I shouldn't be saying this because it's really not in my self-interest to like, even raise the question, but I think it's interesting. And I think that we do need to be thinking um, in these terms um, because I mean, the future is gonna unfold regardless and we can just kind of let it happen or we can try to think about, are there opportunities to optimize it? So you need changes? to come to the North Pacific Management Council and make some presentations. But Julie, like, I mean, I just, it would be very interesting, but like, I shouldn't paint myself as that person, right? Like, well, not for what you're doing. No, no. <laughs> you don't want to be that person. No, you don't want to be that person. Like, I would capture all of the downside by pissing everybody off. <laughs> but anyway, welcome you know, this to is, my world. <laughs> I mean, this is certainly not being, you know broadcast on Facebook. So I think we're fine. 
so so um though um i do want to say that i think gary's bill that he's fostering yep. through the senate is a great for product innovation for pollock and cod and sable fish i heard you say um at some point we'd love to get back into the flatfish game but um and i thought it was interesting that we had a present so we've had all these different presentations along the way I thought it was interesting that um, Bruce Shockler with the food aid was talking about Dover sole landings, that, that that was one of the demands, which we have Dover sole here, but I don't think they could do it on a processing point for uh, at the right um, cost point. But um, sometimes we talk in our own silos instead of across silos. So you're trying to do the startups with your vision, but sometimes I don't know that they you got the policy management, marketing, <laughs> and um, policy side for taxing. So I don't know how we get sure. that conversation to. But it, I mean, it's, it's been my perception that, you know, if you think about the stakeholders in our industry, like we're, we're mainly aligned to defending our slice of the pie, right? And there's nobody really concerned or advocating for, hey, I mean, maybe we should try to grow the entire slice of the pie. ASME is doing the best they can, but that's just, that's like, that's one narrow lever. Marketing is only one component of this. Um, so I think that's kind of, you know, maybe that's the person that I'll try to be. It's like, I'll try to wave the flag of just increasing the size of the pie without trying to get too encumbered by who the benefits go to. And that's a tough position, but, but I don't know, that's, that's part of my thinking. Uh, which. I I, I like the concept of growing the pie. It's always kind of in my vision over the term of my 20 years or 30 years. The problem right now is now you're adding in the, uh, what, the poison? I don't know what the right, of climate change. Yeah. And so we'd had 30 years of pretty stay, count, you know, quotas were pretty stable and people knew what they were going to get out of the ocean. And I don't know that we know what that's going to look like in the future. So is it growing the pie, trying to preserve the pie, or being able to share my pie with you? I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer either, but it's interesting to discuss at the minimum. Yes. Um, can we look at anywhere else around the world that may hit what Alaska fisheries would look like in 2050 before 2050 to get kind of a little sure. bit of a preview of what it might look like. Do you think there's anywhere around the world that kind of has started looking at that stuff before before us and might get there before we do? Sure. So, so as, as we look across the, the globe, there's there's a bunch of different ways that groups of people, societies, countries have engaged with their natural resources and their fisheries, right? And it's you know, I mentioned that continuum of like having a bunch of small boats or having one big boat. And you can kind of measure every approach on that continuum. And so, um, you know, if, if we're maybe a little bit towards the equity side and more participants, um, a place like Iceland has definitely gone on the more like economic efficiency side. Um, this came out of a crisis in their fisheries where um, they said, wow, this, you know, the small boat thing doesn't necessarily that doesn't work it's not profitable it's not safe um they transition to a smaller number of larger boats um fewer jobs in the economy fewer jobs in the sector but average profitability higher um so that's that's one approach um i mean you also have to think about though from a community perspective, and for Iceland's a good example, like what are the other opportunities that are available to, to your residents? And so Iceland, of course, has a vibrant university system and, and other options. So it, it depends on where you look at, at this. Um, you know, in the event that no significant action is made and we're kind of on autopilot for the next 10 or 20 years, um, and we do see a decline in activity. Like, what are those people going to do? Maybe they just leave Kodiak. Maybe they, maybe they are, can jump aboard the growing, you know, aerospace sector. I don't know. Maybe mariculture can help. Um, but I mean, I, I think Iceland is a is an interesting model. But it's, 
it's just, it's, it's that continuum, right? And, and then you have to balance the, like there's an important time element, like, you know, what's optimal in the short run may not be optimal in the long run. And so you can have these difficult conversations about, you know, how we all need to be humanitarians in the short run, but then over the long run, you have to think about the cost. So it's a challenging one. All right, thank you, Thank you, Garrett, for Thank you.